Since a week has passed since that terrifying day in Charlie in um, Colleyville, Texas. In the days that have passed, we've come to learn more about each harrowing hour. We've learned that the rabbi acted bravely, that he instructed the fellow members there to inch slowly closer during the course of the day toward the exit. And as the hours went on and the terrace grew more agitated, and told them to kneel. The rabbi led the others in refusing, sensing that something terrible was going to happen. He created a distraction, threw a chair at the assailant, and he and the other two remaining temple members who were present bolted for the door and escaped to safety. but it did not leave him untouched. Those who've seen him on TV and friends who've commented say that he is, was shell-shocked. The day after the event that morning, we had a gathering of our temple members uh, via Zoom, some hundred temple members. And we all talked and shared I want to share an insight that came that day from one of the newest members of our temple. This new member works with victims. In fact, he was the lead attorney representing the U.S. gymnasts against all those who allowed them and didn't protect them who allowed them to be molested. And in that call, he said, the PTSD that the victims suffer is just the beginning. What people don't realize is that when some evil occurs, it's not just the immediate victim who suffers, but also their mom, their spouse, their dad, their child, everyone who loves them suffers as well. When he shared that, it gave me some insight into something that had puzzled me the night before, which is that I have a niece I'm very close to, and she kept texting and calling throughout the ordeal. She was so upset about what was going on while it was unfolding. And I thought, that's, you know, she's not like she's a regular temple goer, you know. What, why was she so shaken by this? And it made me think that Perhaps she saw in that rabbi, in that congregation, she saw me, she saw all of us, people she loved and people she cared for who do go to temple regularly. Friends, we were all affected by what happened in Colleyville, not just the four in that room, all of us. And so I have a message for all of us tonight. And that is, don't let that change us. Don't let that act of evil make us cold. A couple days ago, uh, the rabbis of Sarasota got together for our monthly meeting, and one of our older colleagues was reflecting on the event and, and just our state of our world. And he said, 20 years ago, if someone came in off the street, even, you know, 
someone looking odd and said they wanted to come in and, 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 and sit in our sanctuary or say a prayer, we would say, yeah, sure. Why not? Come on in. Have a seat. Stay as long as you want. He said, I can't even imagine us doing that now. The truth is, people come up to our temple all the time. Strange, odd people knock on our door, not just now, a year ago, 10 years ago, always. Sometimes they, they come to the synagogue because they think, you know, it'll make them closer to Jesus. Or that we Jews have some special, you know, connection that they want to feel a part of. Or maybe they're just going to every house of worship, you know, and us too. But we've always had strange people knocking on the door, asking to come in. One of the things we've learned about what happened last week is that the assailant was let in. He said he was looking for shelter and though the doors were locked and security, you know, protocols were in place, the rabbi let him in and even made him tea. Was he wrong? Well, of course, in hindsight, he was horribly wrong and irresponsible. All of the best safety measures and protocols and the thickest doors and the bolts and the locks don't help at all if you let in a dangerous person. But was he wrong? The vast majority of the people who come to our door who we don't recognize are not dangerous and have no evil motives. Do we just not let anyone in ever again? The truth is, we can never be free and easy with our doors. Never again. Look, we'll always welcome strangers but we'll do so carefully as we have been for years now. But we need the locks on the doors and the buzzer systems. But it's important that we not let our hearts close as well to others. And that if we have to keep our doors bolted, then we must use other means and try other ways to be extra hospitable, extra warm, and extra gracious to overcome that necessary barrier that we put up. When something like this happens to our people, it's easy to grow angry and insular to be mad at the goyim, at them. We can't trust anyone but ourselves. But to do so would be a terrible, terrible misconception of our world and the nature of our neighbors. Because we know in Colleville, so many neighbors came in support and continue to support the Jewish congregation there. And we know that the FBI sent a plane full of agents who jumped at the chance to risk their lives to save Jews. Look, in another country or in another time, if Jews were in peril, it's just Jews, but not in America and not today. This is not a time 
to grow insular and care only about our own or trust only our own. This is a time to reach out and to embrace. And if we can't open our doors wide, we can reach out to our neighbors, whether that's through our website, through the phone, through letters. There's other ways that we can be part of the community and be gracious. Friends, the rabbi in Colleyville made us proud. He made us proud in the moment of terror with his dignity, using his wits, his bravery to draw attention to himself, to try to save others, the application of the training he received. But I will say he also made us proud in the offering of the tea. When the world reads about this, may they know the Jews are kind and generous. That it is a mitzvah of hachnasat orchim to welcome the stranger. A mitzvah that we Jews have always valued. Jews are kind and beautiful people. That rabbi is, and I look out, and I see before me lots of kind, beautiful, gracious, generous Jews and non-Jews with us. I ask you please, when you see hate in the world, don't lose your goodness. There's always some who will hate, but always stay loving. Think of Nelson Mandela, one of the great heroes of our era. When Nelson Mandela rose to power, he had every reason to be vindictive, to inflict on those who caused him so much pain and suffering, to turn the tables and dish it back. Who would blame him? Who would begrudge him? How many in his place would have done just that? But he didn't. He realized what was best for South Africa, even what was best for his own black people, was for a vital and peaceful nation under his leadership, a place where everyone could feel safe and be citizens, and that meant not seeking vengeance, even if he was justified. We see it in our Torah portion this week. The Torah portion is Yitro, named after Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. This Torah portion is famous for the Ten Commandments. But the Torah portion is not called the Ten Commandments. The Torah portion is called Yitro, Jet, Jethro. And it's remarkable that one of our 54 Torah portions is named for someone who was not Israelite. And the Israelites embraced Jethro, father-in-law of Moses, even though he was a Midianite. And you think, how remarkable. These people just suffered 400 years of brutal slavery. They could have hated everybody, trusted only themselves, but instead they welcomed Jethro. And the lesson they took from Egypt was this. You shall be kind to the stranger, the Torah says, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I'd like to conclude with a midrash. A midrash which I imagine we're all familiar, but I want to recite it again. It's a midrash about when we cross the Red Sea, last week's Torah portion. 
When the Israelites crossed the Red Sea and the waters came crashing down on the Pharaoh's armies and, and drowned the Egyptians and the Israelites saw their dead bodies floating, floating up to the shore, the Torah teaches us. Moses and Miriam led the people in song. Now the Midrash tells the story of what happens in the heavens at that time. In the heavens, the angels all witnessed God's miraculous redemption of the Israelite people. And when the Israelites took up song, all of the angels of the hosts of heaven joined the Israelites in singing songs of praise to God. And God silenced the Israelites. Excuse me, God silenced the angels, told them to be quiet and said, how dare you sing when my children are drowning? There are so many layers, so much in this one midrash. Tonight, let's reflect on this. God silences the angels, but not the Israelites. God doesn't scold Miriam or Moses for singing. Can you blame them after all they went through to be rejoicing? It's their right. But the angels, they weren't the ones who suffered. But more than that, they're angels. They should be on a higher plane. They should strive for something better. I look at this congregation and I see angels. I see kind people who care not only about their own family and their own people but who care about all of God's children here in our community and throughout the world. Events like Colleville, the graffiti on our walls, one after another, they can bring us down and harden us and harden our hearts. but let's not lose those angels in us. And remember that the ones who wrote the Midrash, the rabbis who wrote that Midrash, they didn't suffer the pains of Egypt, but they suffered torture under the Romans. They were slaughtered by the Romans, persecuted and exiled by the Romans. And it is that generation that wrote the Midrash of God silencing the angels. We Jews strive to be better, strive to rise above. And that's why we teach this Midrash because that is our heritage, and that is our way. <laughs>